I meet Bill in Beijing, where he's representing Fujian Province at a government event. Well, I often mention that Chinese. I mean, I say I've been here 31 years, and the Chinese really know the world, but the world doesn't know China. As China's reforms took off in the late 1970s, Bill was serving in the U.S. Air Force stationed in Taiwan. His time there sparked a dream to visit the other side of the strait. In 1988, that dream became real. In the 1980s, Shaman University was the only university in the country that allowed foreigners to study there and bring their families. So Bill headed to Shaman to finish his graduate studies with his wife and two young boys with him. They flew from Los Angeles to Hong Kong and then took an 18-hour overnight boat trip to reach their new home. What's interesting about you is you lived the American dream. I mean, you had a business, very successful, sold it, and came to China. Uh, a lot of people uh, thought you were a lunatic, right? I mean, not just in the yeah, U.S., my, but also my, here. Well, the Chinese often ask, and they say, <laughs> in my family back home, they thought, you know, they were very proud that I'm in business and doing well. They were proud when I was in the military, and then they were proud I was in business, and then I gave it up to come live in China, study Chinese, and then teach for a hundred times less than I was making there. <laughs> but it was exciting. When I went to Shaman, you know, it was sort of a backwater place, and they told me, Shaman University, we're going to build one of China's best MBA programs. And I kind of laughed because I thought, Shanghai or Beijing, yeah, but Shaman, give me a break. They had nothing. The first the foreign affairs, their first electronic equipment, I bought myself. I went to Hong Kong on the 18-hour boat and bought it myself and brought it back. And so they're going to build one of the world's, uh, China's best programs. But they had such vision and such excitement. and. I said, it's exciting to see people like that with dreams. And so I thought, well, I want to help them. So I said, I'll help a year, two years, three years, 30 years. <laughs> and, and here you are. Here I am. And you've had a front row seat to this remarkable story that's happened here in China. Um, so many people say, you know, it was a backwater, and now, you know, <laughs> 800 million people pulled out of poverty, this enormous transformation. You were here kind of watching it. Uh, and, of course, it doesn't happen overnight, but, I mean, what was it like to witness this? Well, it's pretty amazing. Um, when I came in 88, and Shaman, Shaman is a pretty good city, and Shaman University, one of the top universities in the country, uh, I love the people, but the living conditions, out of water, every day the water was off. I built a water reservoir on the mountainside and connected it to the whole building so we'd have water. Um, I carried water up the mountainside like a farmer. <laughs> uh, electricity was out all the time. When, it, when we had it, the power was so low, you, you'd turn on a fan in one building and the power would go out in the other building. And no cars, uh, bike, mostly bikes. And it's just, it was nice. I loved the people. So that's the thing. We, it was kind of like camping out. But we loved the people. But, but we just never expected the change to be this quick. I mean, I had faith. I think, you know, Chinese are very practical people. Historically, they've had these big goals, and they do these big things like Great Wall, Great Floor, and these things. But I really expected 70, 80 years or something. I thought my grandchildren might see it. Never thought I myself would enjoy the kind of life we have now in Xiamen. Xiamen's reputation as a backwater place would quickly change starting in the 80s. Xiamen was one of the first five special economic zones set up through the new reforms. These areas could offer incentives to attract more foreign investment. Since then, Xiamen's urban areas have grown by sevenfold. As a trading port, the city now connects with more than 140 countries. Uh, I covered the two sessions this year, and it seems like for years I've read about the two sessions and it and it's just the rubber stamp you know it, it seems like it's an easy way easy way out i don't really understand the system i'll just say it's a rubber stamp i mean is that how you view it i mean how would you explain the political system here in this country surprisingly i think a lot of what we see today is very similar to what they had 500 years ago or 2000 years ago and i give some lectures on this uh, it's definitely different from our system but it's not and I think they probably, by the time it gets to that level, it is sort of a rubber stamp thing, but there's a lot of thought and planning before it. I'll give a good example. I asked my students, I said, in Fujian, the, the traffic, the, uh, the infrastructure was terrible 25 years ago, but now we have bullet trains everywhere, which is a nice alternative to the bullet cars we had before. And uh, I asked them, you know, how many bullet trains do you have in America? They say, how many? I said, none. 
92, they started planning the one from Los Angeles to California, uh, the Los Angeles to San Francisco, and, and you know that, 2015, they spent 600 million, still hadn't started doing anything yet, and then they said 70 billion US to build it, and then, you know, three weeks ago, our governor said, well, we'll probably never finish it, but 40, they, and they thought 2032 to finish it, so 40 years to build that little stretch, and in China, they've built the world's largest system. So, it's, there's some efficiency behind this, a lot of planning, and I, I've seen a lot of this planning. And the, th and the thing is, this is, two years ago, it was a British guy in Hong Kong. He said, the biggest difference between America and China is not one is socialist and one's capitalist. He said, one's run by lawyers and one's run by engineers. <laughs> but there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, I've known, I've met, not known, but I've met a lot of these leaders and I've seen them go, well, Xi Jinping from vice mayor of shaman to president now. And there's a lot of planning behind this. So I know it's a different system. It's a one-party system, and you know, they make rubber stamps, but there's an awful lot of planning before they actually do something. Between 2000 and 2016, Shaman tripled in size. The city has skyscraper projects in the works, and a new metro line opening in phases with completion in 2020. Shaman also boasts the world's longest elevated bicycle path at eight kilometers long. The shaman of today is worlds apart from what Bill first experienced in the 1980s. At that time, bicycles were a luxury and no one owned private cars. Residents thought Bill and his wife Sue were rich because they bought two bicycles. But compared to their life in California, life in shaman was Spartan. To family and friends in the United States, his decision to move to China made no sense and to some felt like a betrayal talking to your friends back in the United States and it's as though you picked the wrong team um, and some of them were really unhappy about this uh, yeah. talk to me My about father. that <laughs> and, and talk to me about that some of the friends and family's reaction was very strong but the really great criticism I got was foreigners in China it's like because I love China I'm disloyal to America and I said well that's not the point I don't hate them they think if I love China I hate America that's not true in 94 I drove 40,000 kilometers around China to experience it, but 95, I drove 40,000 kilometers around US and Canada because I want my sons to see that too. I want them to love both sides. But I became permanent resident, like I said, mainly because I wanted to show my students, this is where I'm staying. At that point, I decided I'm just gonna stay here. Why go anywhere else? I mean, life's short. If you're gonna do something, do something interesting and meaningful and that may have a change. And China's modernizing, it's uh, Developing and developing depends on business and I teach business. That's pretty strategic. I mean, even though I'm only a teacher and I'm only doing a small thing, I teach a few students. It's pretty amazing to have this opportunity to do that. When Bill applied to be a permanent resident or PR in 1992, there were only a couple dozen foreign residents in the whole country. All of them had made some kind of big contribution to China prior to the founding of the People's Republic in 1949. Bill's application faced an uphill battle. So I applied for PR, but, uh, and they said no, they said foreigners can't apply for PR. I said, that's not true, the Constitution says I can. So I applied to get, uh, so they said, okay, but there's no form. So I said, well, I'll write a form, and I made a form. <laughs> Kept applying, finally said, how long are you gonna do this? I said, till you grant it. <laughs> so they sent the guy down, the shaman from Beijing, to talk to me about it. And he asked a lot of frank questions, and I answered very frankly, and we had some very strong opinions on things. I thought, I'll never get it now, because I should have been more tactful in what I said. But, and then he called me the next day, said, apply again, you'll get it. I said, so I guess they appreciated me being honest about it. But my family was shocked. Uh, but my father is military. I was military seven years. He was military 18 years and 11 years in Asia f in the fighting, actually fighting Korean War, Pork Chop Hill, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Special Forces. 11 years fighting and it was all against the communists, basically fighting China. So he didn't oppose me coming, but he wasn't real supportive. But I just kept writing about China and writing about what we're seeing, just writing about stories, how people live, telling China's story through people's lives, because that's what it's about. I mean, it's people. And I was really moved because my father passed away in 2014, November, but August I went back to see him. I didn't know he was dying. And three months before he died and I saw him, he told me, he said, I'm really glad that you moved to China and stayed there and I'm proud of you. Wow. That's about the second time in my life I cried. The one when the shaman leader sent people to visit me and when my dad said that, I was just so thankful. And he hugged me and I was like, 
because he was a very stern man, you know, but he hugged me. Oh, and then three months later he died, but I was so thankful I saw him and he said that. Just as Bill had a front row seat to China's transformation, he also witnessed the rise of President Xi Jinping. She started his political career in several government posts in Fujian province, including as vice mayor of Xiamen. Well, I, I, I mean, I saw him when he was vice mayor. I had some meetings and stuff, but I didn't pay much attention. I was just here. I didn't speak much Chinese, and I just invited these meetings, you know, it's politeness and all. But when he became governor, then I began to notice him. I mean, he was really sharp, and, and they, had, they invited me to a few of the meetings they had there just because there weren't many foreigners at that time. Uh, but I was pretty amazed his background, his knowledge of history, and, you know, he has a one belt, one road now, but 20 years ago in Fujian when he was uh, governor there, he talked about the start of the Maritime Silk Road in Fujian a thousand years ago, and he encouraged me to write books about that, more books about the culture and the history and the background. And I was surprised a politician knew about those kind of things. He, you know, <laughs> it, it's interesting. Um, uh, early in my career, I, I worked as a junior kid reporter, um, wet behind my ears in, in Arkansas, as I mentioned to you. I know your son uh, lives there now. Yeah. Um, and I covered this attorney general who was just so dynamic and charismatic. And I was like, man, this guy's going to be governor one day. And everybody's like, yeah, he's going to be governor one day. And he was. But he also became president. It was Bill Clinton. Yeah. Um, and it was remarkable to be face to face with somebody like that early in their career and then watch their zenith. I'm just wondering if that was kind of the same experience for you as she did. Well, I would never imagine he'd become president. The thing is, I was impressed. He's smart. He knew the politics, the economics, he knew the history, the culture, he knew all his background. And then I read more about him, found out when he was sent to the countryside, you know, and had no idea he'd ever go back to the city, he thought that was his life. He carried, other people carry food and stuff, he carried wheelbarrow books, he's a bookworm, and he taught locals how to read, and that impressed me, that he spent his time in the countryside teaching peasants how to read. But as he went up the lines, you know, and went to Shanghai, and, and that, even in Shanghai, he, by the way, he's doing the, this anti-corruption stuff very early on. He also was, saw that as a big problem. As he moved up, I thought, wow, I think he'd be a good president. But really never imagined to become president, but I think it's a good choice. <laughs> as the first foreigners to make Fujin home, Bill and his family became well-known in the community. So much so that President Xi knew who Bill was even before they ever met. In 99, I had cancer. I was in Hong Kong in the hospital, really sick and not wondering if I'm going to get out and if I got out what I was going to do. And he sent two people to Hong Kong with flowers to visit me and encourage me. And I thought, goodness, how did he even know I'm in the hospital and why care? I'm just a teacher. So that really impressed me. It's a very personable, very intimate. The, it wasn't just him. It was another politician reached out our, to you. Our, our mayor, who became the party secretary, he sent three people as well with flowers and he wrote a letter. I still have that letter. I've uh, kept it ever since, and he was saying the people shaman are concerned, I hope I get well and come back home. And when I saw that, I cried. I still remember it. Uh, because Americans who visited said, if you get out, are you going home? And they meant the U.S. And I thought, well, I love the U.S., but I don't want to go back there now. I mean, I said, there's still things I want to do in China, and I just, I just really gave up. Because two months, you know, nothing to eat, nothing to drink, you know, just thinner and thinner, good weight loss program. <laughs> uh, so I really, I just gave up. But then when they sent those people to visit me, and then... They said, we hope you come home. Boy, I just cried. I literally did. I told my wife, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going home. But not back to California, <laughs> back to Shaman. And I did. From that day on, I started walking the halls, dragging my IV behind me, you know. And, and I got well, and I came back to Shaman. And some of the university and government leaders met me at the airport, carried me home. I was just, goodness. So that's when I realized. I mean, when I came to Shaman, I was only going to stay one or two years, study Chinese and leave. But and then I stayed longer and longer. But after that, I thought, ah, oh, this is home. Still love to travel, but this is home. Bill's book, Off the Wall, How We Fell for China, documents the family's experiences settling in Shaman through letters Bill wrote to family and friends. In 2019, President Xi sent a letter to Bill praising him for the book. What's it like to get a letter in the mail from the president of China? <laughs> That was quite a shock. I was in the U.S. when I got it, and, they, and I woke up, and my WeChat had like 300-something messages. I said, what happened? They go to war? <laughs> Terrorists? I don't know. And then they said, you got a letter for Xi Jinping. I said, right. It's not April Fool's yet. But I was 
very shy. I wrote him a letter, but just because when I came out the last book, uh, I sent the book and a letter to him, but I thought it was a little forward to do that, but he's the one that encouraged me to write more books in the first place. I never expected him to receive it. I mean, I just, I wrote the letter and sent the book, but I, I honestly never thought he'd get it, but I thought it's polite to do so since he was such a great encouragement. But I never would have imagined that he received it and then replied in a very personable reply and asking about my health. It's been 20 years since I had cancer, but he asked about my health, about my family, am I retired yet? Um, and uh, he heard about me in my new book, he's, like, he, he's liked my new book, and I thought, goodness. <laughs> and then a few days ago when they had the Congress and the Fujian, people were there, he again asked, how is my health and stuff. I just, again, I'm the president of the most populous country on the planet, and he asked about a teacher's health. Just, that's very moving. It's also very motivational because the more I've got to know China, I mean, I love China, but the reason I love China is I love the people. Even when living here was a mess and they said I couldn't eat <laughs> all these problems, I still love the people. And when you have people like the common people I've met and the farmers I've met and then a leader like Xi Jinping, you know, it's just hard not to love the place. Bill loved this place so much that in 2002, he represented Shaman in the United Nations sponsored International Livable Communities Competition, hosted in Germany that year. The meeting was a chance for cities to showcase ideas around city planning and sustainability. To everyone's surprise, even Bill's, Shaman won the top award. I spent eight months researching Shaman. I saw I'd been changing, but I didn't really understand the depth and the complexity. And so then I studied the plans. And I remember several times Shaman built things. I thought, this is crazy. Why are they building this circle road in the beach? There's no cars. Why are they building this shopping center in the middle of nowhere? Um, and then I saw their planning. It's like 20 years ahead, they're planning all these things. So when I went to Stuttgart, uh, we not only won the gold, but the six international judges, I remember one of them said, Shaman's not only number one, but far ahead of number two. And a lot of the, I remember a European mayor though, European mayor, obviously very educated guy, he said, wow, I didn't know China had tall buildings. <laughs> 2002. So that, that led me to realize that China's really changing a lot, but the rest of the world <laughs> it really is clueless about some things. You said it, 2002, like, you know, where are these buildings. people? I mean, uh, <laughs> this is a, is a European mayor of a city, I thought, goodness. Here's one of the things I find really interesting when I come to China, is, is the Chinese and their interest in the world, and yet in the West, the interest in China, uh, this is a perfect illustration. This man should know better than what he said. Yeah, um, he should. What about, what about that? Well, I often mention that Chinese. I mean, I say I've been here 31 years, and the Chinese really know the world, but the world doesn't know China. Uh, but I think there's, and it's easy to blame, though, the West for that. I mean, we're, our media is a bit biased on some things. And when I was in school, I never studied Chinese history or culture. I mean, I saw the Kung Fu movie, TV series when I was young, and I had no idea that, that Grasshopper was Caucasian. I thought he was Chinese. So yeah, I knew nothing about China. Um, but the th so I, I think that uh, we can blame the West for that. But I also think there's a problem with the Ch well, until the last five or 10 years, the Chinese haven't done a lot of really good foreign promotion of the country. I mean, unless a foreigner actually comes here and sees it, all they know is what they read, what they see on TV. I've had some foreigners come here. I had one guy come here, he's a businessman, friend of President Bush. So he obviously travels the world, but the first time he came to China, he came to Shaman, he got off the airport, and he was really nervous. I said, what are you nervous about? He said, well, I'm just afraid that the police arrest me for something. I said, well, what have you done? <laughs> I mean, he was really nervous, and after about three days here, he loved the place. But, so I think, uh, I just think we need to do more promotion, good promotion of China from in China. What's the most common misconception in the West about China, and I know this is an hour-long program, you could probably go on for two <laughs> hours, but, but what, what are some of the things that rankle you? I think one of the things is uh, there's the idea there's no freedom. For example, as Shaman, we have the first church in China built in 1848, so it's historical. First church, I've taken some foreigners there, and they said, wow, we didn't know they had churches in China. We didn't know you could go to a church and not get arrested, and, and this church is uh, very open, and 1,400 people, and everybody was there, and, and then I, I took a foreigner there because he'd heard about it, wanted to see it, and after, after the service was over, he said, do you think any of them are real Christians? 
I said, no, uh, the government paid 1,400 people to pretend to impress you. <laughs> uh, so, uh, well, the, the suspicion piece of the it. The suspicion, uh, yeah. How do you erase that? Well, I, it's, it's not easy. When I first came, uh, my background, military background, when I came, I was excited to come, but I myself had my suspicions about things, or fears about some things. And as soon as I got here, I just really fell in love with the people. And I saw, yeah, it's a very different country from America, but it's good people, a lot of good. There's problems, of course, but a lot of good as well. So I started writing my family about this very early on, saying, you know, China's not entirely like what we thought. It has problems, but it has good too. But they were angry. They, they didn't want to hear about the good. They want to hear about the bad. And one of my family members said I was brainwashed by the communists. And I said, well, I don't know. Maybe I've, before I was brainwashed by the other ones. I don't know. <laughs> so, so I found that I had to sort of take my time explaining this. So I started writing letters and then putting a lot of humor in there, little cartoons and stuff. But every letter I'd add one or two lines about something serious, you know, to sort of slip it in. And over time, people accepted it, but it took time.